subject and we'll throw a lot of information at you quick. What I'm trying to do is just give you an overview of what the fighting was like so that if it's something that interests you, you'll find more information later. Come on now, go do this to me. Oh, that water bottle's in what? Yeah, that's okay. You know, you put in fresh batteries and everything goes wrong. You hit the page. Oh, there we go. Hi, okay, guess. page down. I'll just do that and you can go down. This is my contact information if anybody wants it. Anybody has any follow-up questions later? Yeah, I got the wrong one, they say. Thank you. Okay. Uh, as Americans, we are mostly familiar with European theater World War II with our battles then it's only natural that we are. If you ask most people to name two battles of European theater, they're going to tell you D-Day and the Battle of the Bulge. If anybody pressed you for battle on the Eastern Front, it would probably be Stalingrad. That's what's gotten most of the, the writing. It was a huge battle and all that. There's no real understanding of what the Eastern Front was like, and that's kind of what I want to do in a setup real quick. The scale of that war is beyond the comprehension of America's because we've never been involved in something like it. Not even our participation in World War II was like what went on on the Eastern Front. Two out of every three German casualties occurred on the Eastern Front. There was a battle that I'm going to use as an example in a small town called Velikia Lupi. Some say uh, Velikia Lupi. It's a city of about 30,000 people. It occurred in the winter of 1942-43 at the same time as Stalingrad, which is probably why nobody's ever heard about it. The Germans lost 17,000 men killed in this battle, and by Russian front standards, it was pretty small. This was not a major, major battle. To put that in contrast to the Battle of the Bulge, the Americans lost 19,000 men killed. So our casualties from the Battle of the Bulge, if they were transferred to the Eastern Front, would have been considered moderate and, and frankly, pretty minor. The Russians in that battle lost 30,000, and for the Russians, that was a drop in the bucket. <laughs> okay, uh, somebody could. Sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry, I thought I had this all lined up. So why Vienna, and why did Hitler send most of his forces late in the war to Vienna? Historians are going to tell you there were a couple of reasons. One, oil. The U.S. strategic bombing campaign had bombed the synthetic oil industry in Germany flat. There was no more oil coming from synthetic production, and that had been very significant. There was only one source of oil left to the Germans, and that was an oil field in Hungary at Nagy Knitza. And without oil, you cannot fight a modern war. So without that oil, World War II, as far as the Germans were concerned, was over. We, looking back, know that it was already over anyway. But Hitler was not going to surrender. He would have no choice without that oil. However, that really still doesn't explain it. Because he made the statement, I would rather lose Berlin than Vienna. And that makes absolutely no sense. Because Berlin, if you lose Berlin, the war is effectively over. If you lose Hitler, the war is over. He was Nazi Germany at that point. So my theory has always been there was something in his character, which demonic as it was, that wanted to protect his homeland. If you ever want to write a theoretical paper on something very interesting, how different would the Cold War have been had the Russians captured all of Austria, which easily could have happened. I'm not sure they would have given it back as they did. This is confusion about exactly how things were and, and about how bad the German units were conditioned at that time. One of the major components of the fighting 
was 4th SS Panzer Corps. It was transferred from Poland. It had been scraped together. I mean, this was really an effort for the Germans to rebuild this corps. It was down to 20% of its panzer strength. And yet, this was a major formation for them. Those units were uh, authorized to have about 150 tanks, roughly. They had about 30 at this time each. So that whole corps represented about 40% of the strength of the full strength uh, of Offen SS Panzer Division. Budapest is, was, and always will be the gateway to Vienna. And so I'm going to briefly talk about the fighting there. I don't have a lot of time to go over it. But uh, it was surrounded on Christmas Eve 1944, and the incompetence of the German commander immediately put them in danger because their main supply dump that had been uh, built up for this very uh, occurrence was immediately captured by the Russians. Uh, Hitler declared the city a fortress, a festung. That was a death sentence because that means fight to the last man and the last bullet, no break out of left. Stand and die. Uh, from the German standpoint, that really wasn't a terrible decision because the units trapped there were mobile units. They were not designed for defense, either in open country or in urban fighting. In urban fighting, however, at least they had a chance. These were cavalry units that were men who really rode into battle on horseback. So they didn't have a lot of heavy weapons. And being trapped there actually multiplied their defense factor by quite a bit. This is a good example of what Budapest looked like before the war. This is Buda Castle looking from the uh, looking west. The German garrison was essentially three divisions, uh, 8th and uh, 22nd SS Cavalry Divisions and 13th Panzer Division. These were very badly under strength. They represented about 33,000 men total. The Hungarian uh, component was 37,000 men. The Russians were attacking them with two what are called fronts, and in our terminology, that's an army group. So there were at least four separate armies attacking these 70,000 men. What I'm going to show you now is a really neat graphic, and, and it's an example of a city being chewed up and conquered. And it's a day-by-day -day of the Russian advance on Budapest. While you're watching this on the left side of the screen, you're going to notice that Buda, which is on your left, it's on the western bank of the Danube, the Russians stopped, and there is no progress. And the reason for that is the Russians, well, for a while, it does eventually, the Russians were withdrawing units from that attack to go stop the German counterattacks, the relief attacks. All right? And you'll see what I mean here in just a second. This is every day that changes daily. Now, if you see on the left, Nothing's going on because the units attacking have been withdrawn. Pest on the right is a very flat country. On the left, it's very hilly. So it was much, the defense uh, terrain was much better. Now, the units are coming back. The relief attacks have been defeated, and they're starting to eat it up. And that's all that was left at the end. The Germans, at that point, tried to break out. These are, this is a destroyed Yacht Panzer IV. It's an anti-tank uh, destroyer. These are German Waffen-SS troops in Budapest. And the reason for the arrow is, I thought you might find this interesting. That is a Sturmgewehr 44. That's the world's very first ever purpose-designed assault rifle. Very few of these were made during the war. It's made to replace the standard bolt-action K-98 here on the extreme left. Had the Germans been able to do that at the level they wanted, this was far superior to anything we had at the time, including the Browning Automatic Rifle. This is the Hungarian Arrow Cross Militia. These were basically bully boys who went around the city enforcing order, uh, making people build barricades, forcing the citizens to fight. This is a Russian 37 millimeter flat gun. The Germans tried to resupply by air. It did not work out very well most of the time. This is a uh, glider. Uh, as they did at Stalingrad so many times, they tried to airlift in supplies. What they got was a trickle. Nothing nearly like what they, they needed. This is Budapest after the battle. That's 
through the castle, again, it doesn't look quite the same. The city was virtually destroyed. This is another look. Kind of the same area, the government uh, area. I do find it interesting there's a Volkswagen in the foreground. Uh, not very many of those were actually built during the war, and this must have been high government official. This is a mock-up of an underground hospital that uh, in Buddha, one of the things that helped them hold out on the western side, that was nothing but caves and tunnels that were shell-proof and uh, proof from the air as well. This is a look at the city as a whole. The bridges are down and just kind of an overview of the damage that was done during the siege. The Hungarians actually made their own tanks. I'm not sure why they weren't very good, but they did. And this is the best one they ever made. It's a turn three uh, after the battle. And I thought that would just be interesting to see. These are the relief attacks. There were three. Operations Conrad 1, 2, and 3. And I'm just going to briefly go over Conrad 1 caught the uh, Russians by surprise. It drove in their middle. And they advanced quite a bit, but were eventually stopped by units being pulled out of Budapest. These are a couple photos just to show you what it would have been like to be on the ground uh, during those operations. These are Panzer Grenadiers riding on top of a Mark IV tank. These are uh, 3rd SS Panzer Division Totenkopf on a snowy road uh, during the fight. This is Operation Conrad II. When one did not work, they withdrew forces and shifted them around to the north and actually found a lightly defended road through the mountains and proceeded to attack and get so far, they got to a little village called Pilus St. Karas. And on the top of a tower there, they could see the spires of Budapest where their buddies were surrounded. And they could hear the faint radio police coming from the city saying, come on guys, they started cooking hot food for them. They lined up ambulances because they had actually broken through to the city. And as soon as that happened, Hitler ordered the attack to stop in its tracks. And no pleading would get around it. The city would not be safe from that way, even though the road was open. These are a couple to show you uh, fighting in that area. These are Mark IV tanks in some small village. This is a great example of what it was like to be on the roads. If you weren't on the road, you couldn't advance because it was hilly and wooded. You see a burning vehicle on the right. These roads were icy. That's a panther tank trying to maneuver, maneuver by it. This is another one. This is a column from Totenkopf. These are armored personnel carriers. Again, you can see what the road was like. If there was an anti-tank gun set up to stop them, it was going to be hard to uh, get around them quicker. This is Conrad III. Hitler withdrew from the north, and he decided to shift everything down to the southern part of this operational area. This country is very flat. It's probably where he should have attacked in the first place. Once again, the Russians were caught by surprise. What happened was, go back one. The Germans actually broke through fast and drove all the way to the Danube River. They then turned north towards Budapest. They were almost to the city when there was a huge tank battle, a little village called Pitsen, and were turned back. Now, as you look here on those arrows, especially the one on the south, that's what's called an open flank. There's nothing there. The Germans did not have units to protect that flank. All they had was the spearheads. So they were very open to being surrounded. This is a few, uh, uh, during Comrade 3, a few photographs. That's a, this is a Sturmgeschütz. This is a mobile artillery that the Germans had pressed into use as an armored fighting vehicle because they didn't have enough tanks. Uh, this is probably a Panther from uh, Viking, 5th SS Panzer Division Viking, and it gives a great look at what the territory was like, the lines of sight down there, and uh, you, know, you, you can engage combat at a very long distance. Uh, this is a destroyed Russian Sherman tank. Sherman tanks were American. The two army groups attacking on that area that fought all the way to Vienna were at the very tail end of the Russian supply lines. They were not getting the good stuff. They were getting lend-lease British Valentines, which they hated, and they were getting Shermans. 
Germans, they actually liked because they were very comfortable compared to Russian tanks. Unfortunately, unlike any other tank in World War II, they used gasoline for their fuel. Everybody else used diesel. And that's why when they were hit, they tended to explode and burn. This is a reenactment of Conrad III. We have Civil War reenactors today. Uh, we apparently have uh, war, Revolutionary War reenactors. These people are reenacting uh, Conrad III, and I thought this was interesting just so you could see what the uniforms look like. Uh, this is a diorama, it's a model, and I included it just because I think it's really amazing. Uh, it gives a great idea of what it would have been like to be on the ground then. This is a real picture of the largest German tank of the war, the Tiger II, King Tiger, advancing across uh, a, a snowy field during Conrad III. And then this is a painting of that same thing, which I just really thought brought home what those things looked like. Okay. At this point, the Germans had no choice but to retreat because they didn't have enough units to hold the line. Hitler ordered them to hold in place. That was suicide. The Waffen SS commanders now, despite their oath of loyalty, they were beginning not to do what Hitler told them to do. This is the breakout. On the very last night, there were about 28,000 Germans and Hungarian soldiers left who could walk. They decided they were out of ammunition. They decided it was time to get out. Unfortunately for them, the Russians knew all about it. They registered their guns on their escape route. They had guns of every caliber, mortars, artillery, heavy artillery, zeroed in, and this is what happened. They were absolutely slaughtered in their tracks. These are the vehicles that tried to make it out. Um, 28,000 tried to get out, 19,000 were killed. Less than 700 men made it back to German lines about 25 miles away. This is Unterdamen Frühling Erwachen, Operation Spring Awaken. This is the last major German offensive of World War II. It was on a scale, as far as the units involved, of the Battle of the Bulge. The only difference is the units at that time weren't nearly as strong as they had been. This was Hitler's last throw of the dice. It was idiotic. It had no purpose. The commanders did not understand why he was launching it. He said it was to protect the oil fields, which are out of sight down here on the lower left. But throwing away your armor was not the way to do it. What happened was the weather was horrific. The Rasputitsa had come early that year, and that happens twice a year in Eastern Europe, in the transition from winter to spring, and the transition from fall to winter. And what it essentially does is turn Eastern Europe into a sea of mud. Deep mud, you can't walk in it, it's like glue. If you take a step, your boot comes off, that kind of mud. If you're not on a road, you're not going anywhere. And the only roads in Hungary were dirt. So that didn't help a whole lot. Um, when the Germans launched the attack, they tried to get their tanks off into the fields. They sank up to their turrets. Some of them were so deep they were not even able to recover them. There's a legend, and I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but one of the commanders said, I command a tank, not a submarine. Until the roads dried, there was no support for the Panzer Grenadiers, and that's the German word for infantry. So I want you to envision yourself, you're in a field of mud. A thousand yards away is a tree line. In that tree line are dug in Russian positions, machine guns, anti-tank guns, artillery, mortars. Your job is to capture those. You're waiting in mud, knee deep, to get there. You don't have any artillery support because there's not enough ammunition, and the tanks can't come to help you because of the conditions. In fact, they actually made some progress, but that was a miracle and was simply the fighting prowess that still remained in the uh, Bafanese soldiers. These are uh, just to give you some brief ideas. This is a really nice German drawing. It's a period drawing from that time. Uh, this is, I uh, can't really see my caption, but this is just, oh yeah, this is uh, Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler, the first SS Panzer Division, moving south 
That's a good picture of a uh, Schutzen Panzerwagen, which means uh, basically an APC. These are also Panthers heading south. This is a great look at what the fields were like. If you look on the right, you can see snow that has not yet melted, but where it has melted, that's just knee-deep mud. On the left, you can actually see some reflections where it, it's just water standing in the field. This is also very indicative. This is the best mobility they have. The uh, APC in the foreground is leaning hard to its right. The tank behind it is leaning to its left, and then the one behind that is also leaning to its right. These were what we would think of as roads. These were just strips of mud that weren't quite as bad as the mud on either side. Uh, this is an, just another look at the battlefield. Uh, this is after the roads drive. The Germans were finally able to get their tanks moving. The problem was, the further they went, the more danger they were in because the Russians were just about to launch their Vienna offensive. This is what happened when they did. If you look down at the lower right-hand corner, you can see that bulge the Russian, I mean the Germans had driven into the Russian lines. Their flanks were not well protected. When the Russians attacked, Hitler told them to stand and die, stay in place. Sepp Dietrich, the commander of 6th SS Panzer Army, refused. He disobeyed Hitler's direct order, and he ordered his guys to get out of there. There was a very, very small connection. Lake Balatin is that big, long strip of water. At its northeastern tip, if the Russians got there, any Germans trapped south of there after that were gone. And that was essentially all of it. There was a very narrow corridor, about three miles wide, that was held open against incredibly heavy Russian attacks by 9th SS Panzer Division Hohenstaufen. Those guys basically died in place so that the rest of the army could be evacuated. But the retreat across Hungary was just immense. This was not a tactical withdrawal. This was headlong retreat. It wasn't a route. They didn't throw their weapons away. But you just, I want you to imagine dozens and scores of small groups of Germans, anywhere from 20 to 10,000, retreating, standing. They turn around, make a stand, the Russians start out flanking them. They have a choice either to retreat again, or in some cases they had to fight their way out. This did not stop. It essentially never stopped. But we're taking it right up now to the Austrian border. This is a king tiger that was destroyed in uh, Balatinskaya. That's a little town on the tip of that uh, lake I just showed you. This is just some more German armor. I thought you might find it interesting how many times you had to hit a German tank before it was destroyed. The Panther up there, I think I counted nine direct hits, penetrating hits. Uh, down here, we've got at least three. Oh, keep going, I don't like this slide. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Let's get rid of it. There we go. This is the drive on Vienna. I didn't put the German units in there because essentially they were just battle groups that were retreating in front of the Russians. They, the Russians did what they always do. They outflanked the city. They attacked it directly to pin down the defenders. Then they outflanked it on the southern end. If they had, when they got up to Krems, if you can see that up there, that's where the Danube was. Had they gotten around and across the Danube there, they could have surrounded two German armies. Uh, the Germans fought hard and stopped them. So instead, they turned around and started coming at Vienna from the west. So at this point, Vienna's being attacked from the west, the east, and the south. On the north flank, 8th Army was holding, but it was being really hard, uh, badly pressed. Again, Hitler told them, stand fast and die, do not lose Vienna. The Russian SS it said no. They fight, but they weren't gonna they weren't gonna commit suicide, not anymore. This is April 6th through uh, 13th. This is the actual attack on the city. It kind of shows you the strategic picture, the operational picture anyway. Uh, this is street fighting in Vienna. Again, uh, just another picture of Russians advancing. 
Um, this is interesting because if you lived in Nazi Germany, you lived under constant fear. Anything you said, even if even if it was completely inconsequential, could get you shot, especially if you were a civilian. Because often SS had permission to kill anybody who got in their way. Civilians started talking back to the Waffen SS and telling them to get out of their city. They started dumping hot water on German troops passing through the city. And it shows you just how far their morale had collapsed at that point. This shows something called O5. If you look at the defense here, this is pretty sketchy. Sixth Panzer Division and Third SS Panzer Division. That sounds very impressive when you cite like those titles. At this point, both were at 25% of strength. So, Third SS had maybe 4,000 to 5,000 men. It probably had about 10 tanks. This, and when I say 5,000 men, you in the military know we're not talking about rifles at the front. That's everybody, including all the logistical support, command staff, and everything. Oh, I'm sorry, go back, go back. The key to the whole thing was up here where it says 05 units. That's Volch, that's militia. That's the people they press gang and said, handed them a rifle and said, uh, you may want to take the top hat off or go in the front. 05 was an Austrian resistance group. They were anti-Nazis within the Wehrmacht. They were in command of all of these units. They put them in the Vienna woods thinking that was really hard country for the Russians to advance through, so it would make it, uh, at least give them some advantage on the defense. But when it was discovered that the commanders were all traitors, those units were disbanded. They were told, okay, never mind, we don't need you, go home. And the uh, leaders were arrested. So what happened was, there was no defense for there. The Russians simply passed through there and started attacking from yet another direction. You're going to see that Hitler Youth and Auxiliary Units are the only thing defending Vienna on the, north, on the western and north flank. And Auxiliary Units are simply training commands, maybe an anti-tank company, the instructors at the school and whatever students happened to be there at the time. They didn't have a lot of material. Um, you know, just people press gang into it. The Hitler Youth Battalion was three to 500 kids, 12 to 15 years old. And they were fanatical. And believe it or not, they actually performed better than some of the German regular units. These are, again, Lend-Lease U.S. Sherman tanks in Vienna. This was interesting because you can see that's the same Sherman that you saw in the previous picture attacking the Hildenplatz. This is where Hitler, when he, uh, after the Austrian Anschluss, this is where Hitler gave his speech to hundreds of thousands of cheering Viennese. Uh, again, Russian tanks moving through the Hildenplatz. Is that a Sherman as well? Yes. Yes. Most of what they sent through were Shermans. There were a few heavy tanks, and there was one unit of T-34s. We're now getting down to the end. Uh, April 10th through 12th, the garrison's been pushed back. Um, the Fuhrer Grenadier Division, which was unusual because it was actually a full-strength German Panzer, uh, Panzer Grenadier Division of the time. It had about 50 tanks and for German uh, units in April of 45. That was huge. Uh, but it had to be withdrawn to protect the uh, northern flank. Uh, these are just a couple uh, images. One of the more interesting things is um, the little scout car down there in the corner. Uh, and this is a Russian Maxim machine gun. Okay, these are the bridges over the Danube Canal. Vienna has, is bisected by the Danube River, but it also has a canal that was built late in the 19th century. So you had to get across both. The canal is not that bad of a water barrier. It's bad, but as you can see, the bridges are down, but infantry could still make their way across. And once they did that, they could put up uh, uh, temporary bridges to get the armor across, which is what happened. The State Opera House, 
This was the soul of Vienna, that's at Stevens uh, Cathedral. And I'm going to show you just, for example, the damage, what it looks like uh, later after it was rebuilt. This is ba basically the same view of what it should have looked like. So here we are uh, coming to the very end. The only people left are uh, Das Reich and uh, Second S.S. Panzer Division and Totenkopf. They're being squeezed out. The Russians are about to capture the North Bank. If that happens, there's nowhere to run. The guys on the South Bank, on the Western Bank here, are trapped. I thought I'd take a moment to illustrate how tenacious these Germans still were at this point. The last day was April 13th. The perimeter was about 700 yards. During the night, Totenkopf had withdrawn on Das Reich's left flank. And I'm going to show you all that in just a second. There were about a thousand men left, and when they looked up, there was nothing on their left flank all the way to the Danube. So they had to withdraw the perimeter even further. And it was 700 yards long, but they had to hold out all day on April 13th because there were hundreds and hundreds of wounded who were being sheltered under the eaves of the bridge. And the Russians did not take Waffen SS prisoners. They simply shot them. And they were not going to leave their buddies to die in that fashion. There's a very fascinating story about a, a one single tank. There were two tanks in Vienna on this day. One was on the northern side, one was on the southern side. It was commanded by a man named Arnold Friesen. He was the number top 10 German tank ace of the war. He destroyed 110 uh, Allied tanks. In one day, he single-handedly, he and his tank, held the, the left flank. They destroyed 13 Russian tanks, including when their tank was hit and disabled during the uh, early hours of darkness, Arnold Friesen and his uh, co-commander crawled into the plaza right in front of the bridge that they were holding, the Florensdorfer Bridge. There were four Russian T-34s there. As long as they were there, there was not going to be any evacuation. Picking up Panzerfaust, which was a single-shot anti-tank weapon, they personally destroyed two of the T-34s, badly damaged the third, and drove the fourth off so they could evacuate. All this was done by one tank crew, one Panther tank crew. This is that day. This is what it looked like if you were in the uh, perimeter. You can see it's a very, very small area now being attacked on all sides. This is Das Reich on the Floridsdorfer Bridge. And it's just a great example of what that bridge looked like. This is the same armored column, only from a different view. And if you look on the right, you can see there's a car sticking out of a hole in the bridge. Uh, at this point, the bridge had been hit many times. It was under direct observation by the Russians on a little mountain that overlooks Vienna called the Kallenberg. This is west of the Floridsdorfer Bridge. This is the last... Uh, the, this is the last Mark IV tank in Vienna. And if you look in the background, you can see the spires of the bridge in the Little Red Cross. Standing in front of it is the commander of the division. Uh, this, is, this tank also uh, held out as long as it could and held the Russians up, but it did not make it out. It was destroyed. This is a uh, characterization of the same thing. The uniforms and colors in this are correct, which is why I wanted to show it to you, just to give you some sense of what it looked like to be on the ground. <coughs> ah, this is the commander of Das Reich standing beside the bridge. Under those arches, there are hundreds and hundreds of wounded uh, SS men. Um, he, if you'll notice, he's also wounded in his hand, so this makes it sometime mid-afternoon on, on April 13th. This is that same bridge today. It was destroyed and not rebuilt, but the uh, pilings are still there. This is what it looked like after the Germans evacuated and blew it up. This is looking down on Vienna from the Kallenberg, the mountain I was just telling you about. Uh, that's a pretty good artillery observation point. Yeah. 
You know, nothing's going to move in that city, and especially over this bridge, which is why they could not evacuate during the day. They tried to reinforce it. When they did, all they did brought down was a storm of fire. That yellow line is roughly the perimeter that they were holding. This is, this is showing you that mountain, but from the opposite side. That's the common bird up there in the, uh, at the top. Uh, I found this very interesting because this is just a Russian soldier uh, in the ruins of Vienna, except the Germans really liked Russian machine guns. Whenever they could, they would pick up one of those. You may have seen them. They've got the round magazine. For some reason, the Russians preferred the German machine guns, and he's holding a German MP44. This is captured German vehicles afterwards. There's a couple of interesting things here. If you look over on the right, there's two Tiger I tanks. That has to be from Totenkopf. They were the only two that still had them. They had discontinued these tanks 15 months earlier. And if you ever want to win a bar bet, ask them. The Tiger's pretty famous. I'm sure everybody's heard of the Tiger tank. They made less than 1,400 of them, which in terms of war on the scale of World War II is a drop in the bucket. And yet, Every tank that uh, Americans encountered, they thought it was a Titan. Oh, down here in the lower left, the Captain Crab. That was a really neat forerunner to the ATV. That's a two-person tracked vehicle that could go through almost anything. Tow supplies, that kind of stuff. What's the one right there, right there above it to the left that's got its nose facing towards us? Which, it just, it's just so interesting looking, I had to ask. <laughs> I knew you were going to ask that. That has to be a French cellular. I, I, I can't think of anything else that possibly could be. Which means that it was captured during the invasion of France in 1940. And used. And, well, not used in the sense you're thinking. I suspect that was at either the anti-tank uh, training school or they were using it as an elementary type of vehicle to train tank drivers. We're about done here. This is just some more captured Germans. These are Panther tanks. This is that same scene looking from the other end of the street. This is the Reason Rad. Anybody here ever been to Vienna? Did you ride the Reason Rad? Okay. The Reason Rad is pretty cool. It's actually a Ferris wheel, but the carts are old uh, tram carts that they've converted to be on here. You can see there's none on there now because they were all destroyed. The plotter where it sits is a giant wooded park. If you go there, it's nothing but games, video games, rides. It's really cool. Uh, I spent a lot of money there. One night. This is what it looks like now. Kind of as an illustration of the damage done to the city during, uh, during the battle. Afterwards, and this is, we're pretty much at the end now, this was pretty much it. Taking Vienna cost the Russians such heavy casualties that they really could not advance much further. The Americans were driving into Austria from the west, and the German units that were there were actually having to build defenses facing both ways because they were so close to both the Russians on one side and the Americans on the other. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of fighting after that. The Germans did get out. They did escape from Vienna with whatever was left. I thought you might find this interesting because this is a follow-up to at the end of the battle. It's all over with. The end of the war is here. If you remember, I told you 9th SS Panzer Division Hohenstaufen had basically sacrificed themselves to hold that quarter open during Operation Spring Awakening. The division was more or less destroyed. To show you how incredibly efficient the German supply system still was, at the very end of the war, on the very tail end of the Eastern Front, with chaos everywhere, Hohenstaufen ended the war over strength. It was authorized to have about 20,000 men. At the end of the war, it had 22,000 men. So even now, the Germans were identifying combat-worthy men and transporting them all the way to the very end of their front. The other thing that's interesting is this is a Yacht Tiger. It's the largest vehicle the Germans built during the war. 
It's an anti-tank vehicle. It mounts not the 88, and I imagine most people who are familiar with World War II have heard of the 88. It mounts the 128 millimeter anti-tank gun that was also used in a, in a uh, dual purpose role, uh, I mean anti-aircraft gun that was used as an anti-tank gun. Oh, on the occupied camp, I'm sorry, the story is this. At the end of the war, seven of these, on May 7th, VE Day, the day Germany surrendered, 1st SS Panzer Division took possession of seven brand new Dodge Tigers. These were expensive and timely, to, took a lot of time to build. Seven of them brand new. They only built a little over 100 of them during the whole war. So when the Life Standard got them, they blew them up. Are you kidding? That's all they could do. They were, they were trying to get to the Americans to surrender because they didn't want to surrender to the Russians. And they were blowing up everything they possessed because they weren't allowed to bring weapons in. And they blew up all seven of them, sitting on the rail cars. That's it. After that, the Germans surrendered. Uh, could I answer questions for anybody? <laughs> Thank you.
I was all tied up and I was here late. And the first guy was talking to me. I finally told my son, I said, just leave because these things keep interrupting the stuff. How it works. Yeah. Now, you know, I get a phone call. I appreciate it. Well, yeah. Well, those are great. I love those. Uh, I'm sorry? I love those. Uh, the photos that you have.